Damn. Oh, we are live. Good evening. All right. Hello, everybody. We could not be more <laughs> pleased tonight. We we uh we feel like luck has descended upon us, uh, and hopefully uh uh you, you'll you'll uh we're we're obviously I'm even speechless. Uh, we have tonight uh an amazing writer. But before we, how are you tonight in in Wheeling, West Virginia? I am uh, fantastic. It's a little rainy, but at least the weather has been uh, fairly warm. All these beautiful um, trees and everything this year has been absolutely spectacular. How are you over there in Prospect-ish PA? I, I am I am speechless. I am so excited. I am excited, too. I couldn't wait for tonight. So, yeah. So, the, I think we ought to tell our readers who is on tonight or our listeners yeah. who is on tonight. I can't wait. Uh, so tonight for you, we, we have one of the, the we, we've loved all our writers. We're so, so grateful that so many fine writers have come on, but we are super excited tonight. We have a Pittsburgher who is a finalist for the National Book Award. Uh, that Pittsburgher is Disha Filsha, Filia, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't even talk. Disha, Disha Filia and her debut short, debut, debut short story collection, The Secret Lives of Church Ladies from WVU Press, focuses on black women, sex, and the black church. She's also the author of Co-Parenting 101, Helping Your Kids Thrive in Two-Parent Households After Divorce, which I have read. I read seven years ago when it came out. Written in collaboration, collaboration with her ex-husband. She was not only an amazing writer, she, she wrote a book with her ex-husband about raising children. I, I, I'm i just, I'm speechless. <laughs> her, her work has been listed in notable, uh, as notable in the Best American Essay series, and her writing on race, parenting, gender, and culture has appeared in The New York Times, The Washington Post, McSweeney's The Rumpus, Brevity, Dead Housekeeping, Apogee, Catapult, Harvard Review, ESPN's The Undefeated, The Baltimore Re Review, Ebony and Bitch Magazines, and various anthologies. Disha is a fiction fellow and a past Pushcart Prize nominee uh, for essay writing in full grown people. So let's bring out Disha Filia. Ah. Hello. Hello. Telling everybody on Facebook that we're live. I might have told them <laughs> with a typo. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's just a capital W instead of a lowercase W. <laughs> How are you both? Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. We are ecstatic. Yes. We are absolutely thrilled. Thrilled that you're on tonight. Thank you. And it's loved. To, it's just so wonderful to see a Pittsburgher representing uh, the city as a National Book Award finalist, and, yeah. and you know, in concert with, with, with Terrence a few years ago. It's like the whole wow, Pittsburgh is uh, is coming hard. I mean, it's you know yeah. amazing. Pa Terrence was one of the first people to text me um, when I was long listed, and then he just texted me. I think it was either this morning or yesterday. Um, so you know, I'm in amazing company. I'm just I'm really honored. Um, not only as um, I'm originally from Jacksonville, Florida, but I've lived in Pittsburgh since 1997. Um, but also to be on uh, University Press, West Virginia yes. University Press, that doesn't happen a lot for for university presses to be on the uh, National Book Award finalist list. So happy to be representing. Amazing stuff. All right, are we? Let's let's disappear and okay. let Disha do her thing. All right. So I'm going to read um, a little bit from two stories uh, from my collection, The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. Um, the first bit that I'm going to read is from a story called Peach Cobbler, and it's the first two paragraphs, so I don't need to tee it up for you. My mother's peach cobbler was so good, it made God himself cheat on his wife. When I was five, I hovered around my mother in the kitchen watching, close enough to have memorized all the ingredients and steps by the time I was six, but not too close to make her yell at me for being in the way. 
and not close enough to see the exact measurements she used. She never wrote the recipe down. Without having to be told, I learned not to ask questions about that cobbler or about God. I learned not to say anything at all about him hunching over our kitchen table every Monday, eating plate after plate of peach cobbler and then disappearing into the bedroom I shared with my mother. I became a silent student of my mother and her cobbler making ways, even when I was older and no longer believed that God and Reverend Troy Neely were one in the same, I still longed to perfect the sweetness and textures of my mother's cobbler. My mother, who fed me TV dinners, baked a peach cobbler with fresh peaches every Monday, her day off from the diner where she waited tables. She always said Sunday was her Saturday and Monday was her Sunday. What I knew was that none of her days were for me. And I'll read um, a longer bit from a story called Snowfall. And I'm reading from the middle of that story. So I'll give you a little background. Um, the narrator is a woman named Arletha. And um, she and her girlfriend, Rhonda, moved um, from the South to a cold, cold place. Um, and um, she's um, not, they're not enjoying the cold at all. Um, and they left behind uh, family members who uh, were not approving of the two of them being in a relationship together. We were born and raised in warmer places, Georgia and Florida. Warmer too in the residual charm, polite smiles and gentility of the white people whose ancestors owned ours. In the South, the weather does not force tears from your eyes, causing the faces of passing strangers to register worry about you for a millisecond. It's the wind you want to tell them, but a millisecond is not enough time. In the South, the weather does not hurt you down to your bones or force you to wake up a half an hour early to remedy what has been done to your steps, your sidewalk, your driveway, and your car as you slept. But the South has hurricanes, they say. Yes, but not damn near daily, not for a full quarter of the year. You tell people up here that you're from the South and nine times out of 10, they say the same old thing. I'm sure you miss the sunshine. Rhonda and I both miss taking sunshine and easy morning commutes for granted. But what we really miss are the laughter and embrace of our mothers and grandmothers and aunties, kin and not kin. We miss the big oak tables in their dining rooms where as kids in the 70s and 80s, we ate bowl after bowl of their banana pudding as they talked to each other about how much weight you'd gained like you weren't even there. We miss helping them snap green, pea, green beans and shell peas sitting at their kitchen tables, watching the young and, rest, the, young and the restless on the TV perched on the pass through. We miss how they loved Victor Newman hated Jill Foster and envied Miss Chancellor and how she dripped diamonds and chandeliers. We miss their bare brown arms reaching to hang clothes on the line with wooden pens. We miss their sun tea brewed all day in big jars on the picnic table in the backyard, then later loaded with sugar and sipped over plates of their fried chicken in the early evening. We miss lying next to them at night in their four poster beds with two soft mattresses covered by iron sheets and three generation old blankets. We miss their house coats perfumed with absorbing junior liniment and hints of the white shoulders they'd spritzed on from an atomizer that morning before church. We miss tracing the soft folds of their skin when we held hands and watched our favorite TV shows in their beds. Dallas, Dallas, Dallas Dynasty, Knott's Landing, and Falcon Crest. We miss how they laughed and were easy with each other, how their friendships lasted lifetimes, outlasting wayward husbands and ungrateful children. Outlast at that time, Alma caught Joe cheating and she whacked him on top of the head with the sword he'd brought back from the war but he told the people at the hospital he didn't know he did it. 
outlasted having to hide your medicine bottles in your shoes because otherwise seven of your nine children were liable to steal them. We miss how they seem to judge everyone but themselves. Or maybe that judgment was in the nerve pills they procured from the Chinese doctor on Bay Street who didn't ask questions. We miss their furtive cups of brown liquor on Friday and unabashed cries for Jesus come Sunday. We miss their one gold tooth that made us wonder who they had been as young women. We miss their blue crabs the shells boiled to a blood red in wash tubs atop bricks over makeshift fires built in the yard. The wash tubs reminded us of cauldrons full of rock salt and cayenne drenched water, bubbling and rolling, mesh bags of seasonings and halved onions and peppers floating on top, along with potatoes and ears of corn. We miss how they stood over those cauldrons like witches stirring a potion with sweat beating on the tips of their noses and smoke swirling around their hands and wrists, they wielded long handle spoons to press the frantic flailing crabs toward their deaths. We miss how they made our Easter dresses and pound cakes and a way out of no way. But we lost all those things when we chose each other. Only the memories remain, which is why even though we grew up in different places, so many of our bedtime conversations start with, remember when? As we lie there in the dark with our nostalgia and nothing to distract us from it, not even each other, not anymore. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> That was amazing. Thank you. Such lovely work. I, I, I the, the second piece I want to say more about, but that first piece, the the line about TV dinners is just like like a knife. Yeah. It makes TV dinners for me. Christina, you are back. I am back, and I I was taking such good notes, and I just disappeared. <laughs> Um, I love the line about your mom's pie make, is so good. It makes God want to cheat on his wife. <laughs> that was just like so great. And I, and it, it made me think, cause I think a lot about the relationship between women and cooking and yeah. women and food and being in the kitchen. Um, and yeah. I was also thinking about, um, you know, I hate the snow too. And okay. I was, but I was, <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> but what I was thinking about was, you know, missing those bodies of other women, mm -hmm. my grandmother, my mom, yes. and how yeah. how much more poignant that is right now during COVID that, you know, even if you had the ability to just go wherever you wanted to go at this point, you couldn't mm -hmm. because of that. And those people, mm -hmm. those relationships, and those expressions of affection yeah. and care and love are not, they're not accessible to us at this point. So. Yeah. Thank you. So that was just so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, the, 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 the rendering of that, of the of complicated feelings about abandoned family geography mm -hmm. and, yeah. and there's such delicious details, <laughs> like each of them, it's, it's just layered and layered and layered. So you can feel, I read the, or I hear you read uh, and I'm, I'm in this kitchen. Yes. yes. With yes. them. And, and so much good stuff that. happens in kitchens. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. So WVU Press uh, has thanked you for a shout out. <laughs> oh my goodness. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, it's a dream team over there. It's a, it, there are four people on staff and they just make magic. So I am thrilled. Awesome. Um, to have my book published by um, WVUP. Well, and as a West Virginian, uh, I, I'm grateful to hear that because, you know, yeah. WVU is our flagship and yeah. um, the press has done amazing things for Appalachian Voices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and now this, I can't, I can't wait to see what they do next and how much bigger it's going to grow. Yes, yes. Right, you also have a some... murmuring. I have a pug here that wants to like be near me right now. So I heard that's not that. me growling. Oh gosh! <laughs> and I She's thought right here. 
And I thought, I, w I wonder, maybe she hasn't had dinner yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's just, well, I had two pugs and her brother, her litter mate, litter mate passed away recently. So she's Aww. been a little closer to me. I mean, they've always, you know, pugs are, are, are um, you know, really loving dogs, but uh, she's a little closer these days. So she's here for the reading tonight. <laughs> I bet. Well, you know what, though? That's the best thing about these Zoom and uh, StreamYard and all these virtual mm -hmm. readings is that you're not just with the writer as they stand officially in a room, but you're in right. their space with them. And I yes. love that. We've, we've seen these incredible kitchens and living rooms. <laughs> we've, we've seen dogs. We've seen children. We've seen all yes. kinds of different things. <laughs> and it makes it I don't know. It makes all of you amazing writers more accessible, I think, yeah. to yeah. people who might be intimidated. And that's so important, you know, to just having community and and knowing that um, it is, you know, that we are accessible, but also that the work is, you know, that yes. I, you know, I remember 20 years ago wanting to connect with other writers and know that it was possible to do what they were doing. And and um, and feeling like you know they're human too, and and everybody's had to start somewhere. So I think this reinforces that when we can see people sort of in their element. Absolutely, and and you feel like you know it's more of a I'm hanging out with you instead yeah. of instead of you know you're talking to me from a podium or something like that. Yes. Yeah. So. so that was Bonnie Sinclair, one of our Clarion University students. Oh, wonderful. And, yeah, she's a, uh, our social media chair uh, for our for, uh, Clarion's literary magazine. Mm -hmm. So exciting to be a fellow, excuse me, to see a fellow Pittsburgh author can't wait to read your work from Bonnie. Oh, good. I look forward to you reading it. Thanks. People have been in touch via Instagram and social media, and, and it's like the book gets a new life every time someone else reads it and they tell me that they connect with it in ways that, you know, I never even imagined. That's awesome. That is, that's probably the, one of the best feelings as a writer when somebody mm -hmm. picks up something from what you've written that you just didn't see in those pages. Yeah. And then they tell yeah. you that and it's like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Thanks for telling yeah. me. So, yep. Oh, we're so, so happy that you came on Thank to read you. for us. Good Thanks. luck in everything. My pleasure. It's a wonderful Good luck with everything. Thank you. Yeah, break a leg uh, in November. Right. <laughs> yes, November 18th yes. is the National Book Award Ceremony. So, we will keep our fingers yeah. crossed. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. All the I best. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. All right. Good night. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. See you next Thursday. See you next good Thursday. Night. Take care. Be safe. Yes, you too.